201201. No, Miss Betty. To whom? That's a terrible joke. No. All right, we're going to get started this evening. <laughs> it's good to see you all. Here we're going to start with 201. He is able to deliver thee. Let's stand and we'll sing 201. He is able to deliver thee. Good to see you all here this evening at Anchor Baptist Church. Whoa. 201. Let's stand and we'll sing. He is able to deliver thee. The grandest theme through the ages rung. 201. Tis the grandest theme through the ages rung. Tis the grandest theme for a mortal tongue. Tis the grandest theme that the world has sung. Our God is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. He is able able to deliver thee, though by sin oppressed, go to him for rest, our God is able to deliver thee, tis the grandest theme in the earth or main, tis the grandest theme for a mortal strain, tis the grandest theme, tell the world again, our God is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee, he is able to deliver thee, though by sin oppressed go to him for rest, our God is able to deliver thee. Tis the grandest theme, let the tidings roll to the guilty heart, to the sinful soul. Look to God in faith, he will make thee whole. Our God is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. Though by sin oppressed, go to him for rest. Our God is able to deliver thee. Oh, okay, Brother Hanson is off for the day. So we'll do an announcement. Does anybody need a prayer list? I need a new prayer list. Who needs a new prayer list? All right. Well, it's good to see you all here this evening. Uh, we got all kinds of stuff coming up. Uh, we just finished VBS. VBS was a good time. It was a very good week. Um, coming up, we got Brother Samson Ryman will be here on the 21st. I was trying to figure out what the date was going to be. Sam, there it is. It's on the thing. 21st, Samson Ryman will be here. Uh, also, note next week, Sunday, August 14th at 2 p.m. is choir practice. Uh, we want to get one more in before we go for, or before we have the, uh, these preachers coming in. Um, if you weren't in the last one, you want to join, come on in. Water's fine. Yes. Uh, so that will be next Sunday at 2 p.m. Just bring some lunch, hang out in the back for a little while, and then we'll do practice. Um, Brother Mark McGahee will be here August 28th through the September 2nd with the due sets, so keep that in prayer. He will be here 28th through the 2nd. That is a full week, so 
Uh, be in prayer for that. Come pray up for that. Tell people about that. Invite them. And please try and make it out here. Support your church. Um, so yeah, Brother McGate, he, he's been coming here forever. <laughs> we can't get rid of him. We've tried to get rid of him. We can't get rid of him. He keeps coming back. But uh, the do sets will be here, and if the, the do sets are worth coming on their own. Uh, Brother McGay, he's a good preacher as well. Um, also coming up September 30th through October 1st is the youth rally at the Manorazis Church, which is Heritage Baptist Church. I believe it's in, in Maryland on the eastern shore. Um, I'm going to be going to that. If I get enough interest, we'll take the van and... If there's not, I'll just take you know whoever I can fit in my car or whatever. But that is going to be a very good time. I am planning to go over and spend the night. September 30th through October 1st. September 30th. It's a youth rally, yes. Say again. Um, there's three people preaching. I don't know two of them, but one of them... I actually, I don't think I know any of them, but I know that one of the preachers is named Mike Gray. It is not Mike Gray that used to go here. It's a different Mike Gray. Yes. <laughs> um, he, I think I've heard him once before, and I, he has an excellent reputation. Uh, so they, those three are going to be preaching. They're going to have a Friday night service. I believe that's at 7, and then a Saturday morning and a Saturday evening, and then we'll come home that night. I'm going to get a flyer off of them as soon as they can make it. Uh, but we are planning to, to get a hotel. If anybody's interested, you need a ride there, you want to figure something out, let me know. This is, yes. 10 and 4. Okay, that'll be nice. Samson Riot, uh, Samson Riot. Samson Ryman, Eddie Wyatt, and it is Mike Gray? Okay, so Samson Ryman and Eddie Wyatt. I have heard of Eddie Wyatt before. I don't think I've heard him preach, but he's supposed to be very good. All right. And then Samson Ryman is Samson Ryman. Al yes, sir. Levy. Not Eddie Wyatt. Levy Wyatt. I don't know Levy Wyatt. Levy Wyatt and, okay, Samson Ryman. Mike Gray. Okay. Um, so that's all coming up. Um, Bible Institute, say what? Ladies Retreat is the first, second, October 7th. Okay. Yes, so Faith Baptist with Pastor Ryman has their Ladies Retreat October 7th to 8th. There's going to be a whole bunch of ladies going, from what I understand, so they might try and take the van. Oh, my God, I'm going to leave that one alone. So that's a very good uh, meeting. It's just for ladies and try to encourage them. There is a registration, so if you want to go to that, um, I think you have to know before October 6th. <laughs> you to know. Before. So I don't know the exact time for registration cutoff, but if you want to go to that, it's supposed to be very encouraging. I know Mom's gone, Michelle's gone, Miss Betty's gone. A lot of ladies have gone to that, and it's been very good. Um, and then Bible Institute, when is that going to start up? Bible Institute starts first week of September. Second, first or second, we have to get an exact date. And that's just going to be CDs coming out on a weekly basis, correct? One a month. Gotcha. Okay, so four lessons a month, but it comes out to the same as one a week. Um, <laughs> I just had a realization with that. But uh, Brother Klotz, do you know what you're teaching? Manuscript, pastors teaching manuscript evidence. No. <laughs> I 
And you're just going to stand up here and read the book. I don't know what, yeah, I don't know how you. And the problem with that is that if you just pick up the manuscript evidence book and just start reading it, the first 40 pages are in German. And the second 40 pages are in Latin. <laughs> so you're just going to be standing up here going, uh. <laughs> the, don't worry, the third 40 pages are in English. So you get, you, that's where you kind of get it down. But do you, Pastor, do you, you know what you, specifically what books you're teaching or subjects or? All right, I will be teaching Second Thessalonians, and I can tell you that it will take a semester to get through all three chapters of Second Thessalonians, because I know how fast I move, which is about, four, well, I did it last time, four verses in 45 minutes. So that works out to a semester. I don't know, we'll just figure out something for the spring. Uh, anything else for that, Brother Klotz? Okay, so that's Bible and Sue. That'll start up second week of September. Uh, any other things coming up? I think that's everything. Okay. We all survived VBS and all that. We just got to go now. We got to go through uh, revivals and youth rallies. Summer is VBS season, and then fall is youth rally season. Um, all right. S salvation. Anybody new under salvation? Let's maybe get in a good witness this week. Miss Betty? Oh, Miss Ginny. Mm. Miss Ginny, she's third from the bottom on your salvation. Miss Betty was a caretaker with another lady for a few years. She doesn't think she got saved. No, she got the gospel. I know she got the gospel many times. So if she took it, she took it. If not, it's, it's on her. Anybody else in their salvation? Miss Sarah? Pray for Michelle works with a, uh, a bunch of girls. She works at a coffee shop, which is run by a church, and most of the girls there aren't saved. It's not actually run by the church. It's sort of associated with the church. And most of the girls there don't go to the church. and Most, say again? They're mostly young girls. So Michelle's gotten a couple opportunities. Um, just pray for Michelle's coworkers. She's got about, yes, she's got about 15 coworkers. It's all women. There's one guy. It's run by one man, and he has about 15 women working for him. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how, but so the man is single. I'm going to leave that one alone. Anyways, moving on to sickness. On to sickness. Mm -hmm. These are people that I have witnessed to through time. I've got to invite a boss back to church because I don't work on that project with him. Same thing with Roberto. He doesn't go to my project anymore. Wes worked for a different company. I got a good witness in with him. Uh, Maddox is a guy that I met in the gym. I believe he's saved, but he's weird. Dennis and Kevin. Uh, I work with Kevin still. So, yes, ma'am. Yes. Amen. That's always nice. It's like, all right, we get to salvation. You know, pray for so and so, remember so and so. There. Hey, we get to, every once in a while you get to take one off. Do you know her name? Okay. But God knows her name. That's the important thing. Uh, about 10 from the bottom on the first salvation list, Catholic lady Betty's brother is witnessing to. She got saved. <laughs> Anyone else under salvation? Sickness. Any changes on the sick list? Everybody doing better? Nobody's getting sick? Miss Betty. Ah, Madison has COVID. Keep Madison in prayer for a lot of reasons, but she also got saved about a month ago. And you know what happens when you get saved. The devil comes right after you. And she's already been through enough. So just keep her in prayer. Um, yes.
yes. Miss uh, Izzy May has, Izzy May spelled with an E, has her hearing test on the 31st. Yes, I-Z-Z-Y, and then her middle name is May, M-A-E. I spelled it M-A-Y once, and I was severely corrected. <laughs> but Izzy, she has, yeah, that's on there. It's about a third from the bottom. Anyone, Michelle? Yes. Mm -hmm. Jody Hamrick, um, she's got chemo, they did the operation, she's, on, she's going through chemo, she's got six treatments, one every three weeks. She says by the time that she gets better from one, she's got another one, because it just, it just takes all of her energy out. So just keep her in prayer, um, Nikki. They're, they're, or I'm sorry, Jody Hamrick, she's about, a, she's a couple under Izzy. They're doing, they're handling it well from what I can tell, but it's not an easy thing to handle. Uh, anybody else under sickness? Miss Sister Mickey. Okay. And his name is, it's something Emmanuel? Donald, Israel, not Emmanuel. Mm -hmm. Oh, she depends on him. Mm-hmm. Were you, was that in Georgia? Yeah, Georgia. So, so, so uh, a couple of people on here. So Mickey's brother, Donald Israel, has been found. He had some kind of a surgery, but there's not many details on that. So just keep him in the whole situation for, he got saved three months ago or so. And then uh, a longtime friend of Sister Mickey, his name is Charlie Blessing. He's about 78. He's lost a lot of weight. He's got some kind of a health problem. 
Um, and he's very stressed because his daughter depends on him. Her name is Sherry Allen, and she needs help with getting herself together so she can take care of him. And then Zariah prayed for an, an elderly man at the gas station. He was on a cane, and it's whatever you're doing, Sister Mickey, keep doing it. <laughs> Thank God for that. Um, anyone else on their sick list? Okay. Amen. history. When I came to you, I have osteoporosis and scoliosis. And, and Dr. Chen was like, oh, then that's why it's so high. Duh. <laughs> so. Sorry about the three months of stress for the liver biopsy. Pain. <laughs> yes. So, praise God, everything's fine. It's just my bones. <laughs> All right, so Ms. Betty had her Bone. liver biopsy, Bone. and that came back yeah. good, and then Problem. It's just the existing problem that she has with osteoporosis and scoliosis. So keep her in prayer for that, but thank God it's not something more serious than what she has still. Miss Michelle? Oh, yeah. Michelle has an EKG tomorrow. Um, she's always had a, like a little flutter or something with her heart, so they're doing that. The doctor says it's probably not a big deal, but they're doing it just to make sure everything's all right. And then uh, she's still doing dental work. So, oh, Lord willing, we're almost out of the woods on that. But we, we're, we're, thank God we're almost out of the woods on the dental work. So we keep praying for Michelle's teeth and our EKG. Uh, anyone else under sickness? All right, answers to prayer. Uh, thank God that... We got to see one saved at VBS. I've been praying for to see that a kid would get saved there. Good. And it was good. Um, thank God for answering little prayers. I've had a lot of little prayers recently, just little things. God, can you help with this? And then it gets fixed. It's like, oh, we answered prayer. And well, you prayed, and I answered it. That's kind of why we pray, isn't it? Yes, that's why I told you to pray. <laughs> but God's been very good to me. Jesse. Yes. Jesse had an unspoken. Very important. And Michelle I also it. have a huge unspoken yes. physical. And then as well as um, my sister is really happy that she's on drugs. Yes. She's working the same place that we <laughs> Oh, you work with Joelle. Oh, boy. You'll be fine. <laughs> she's hardy. You can't kill him here. You can't, you can't, like, mur mirrors are hardy. Um, Joelle and I, don't, just don't talk about me. <laughs> just don't talk about me. I, Unless you want her to leave her job. Yeah, if you don't like her, start telling her, how, we got this associate pastor, and he's just great at everything. She'll be gone. <laughs> she'll yeah, she'll be ill, and then she'll be gone. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> Others. Anyone under others? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Sister Mickey? Lord, we're going to run our way here to the forecast service, and we did. 
<laughs> yes. Okay, so keep Sister Mickey in prayer. She's going to answer her prayers. She's praying about moving back to Georgia. It feels like God wants her to, but when, when is the question? That's, a lot of times, that's what it is. Like, God, I know you want me to do this, but when? And the timing is almost as important as what he asks you to do. So keep her in prayer, and we love having you here. Yeah, we're not going to pray about that. We'll keep you here as long as we can. <laughs> Uh, anybody else under others? Uh, Jonathan, can you run in the back and get the markers for this? Uh, ladies with child. Nobody under there? Okay. Okay. Emily Waymeyer, uh, if she doesn't have her baby in the next week or so, she's going to get induced, and they want it to happen naturally, and then Adam, Amanda Sawyer is getting closer. Uh, unspokens? Four. Four unspokens. Work and job situations. Uh, I'm just going to run quick through this. Uh, I'm looking to find a different job. I got a, a guy reach out to me from another company that I was kind of looking to work for. Um, the guy that I talked to is in a youth pastor in a Baptist church, so we had a great conversation. Um, and Lord willing, the job's going to open up late in August. I'd like to move there because living and working for Clark is not, they're not really going together. Thank you, Jonathan. <laughs> oh, I could say so much right now, and I'm just going to move along. But just keep that in prayer. Lord willing, I'd be getting this job 
mid-October. I would really like to. It's full-time teleworking, and I just, working for Clark is not conducive to the life that I want to live. And that's, every once, every week or so, God puts another person in my path to say, hey, I, you prayed about this, and, I, we're gonna move, and I'm ready to move on. God puts another person in my path to say, hey, staying with Clark is not a good idea. We are in Nags Head. Michelle and Mom going to Duck Donuts in the Outer Banks. And Michelle just starts talking to the guy ahead of her in line. He goes, oh, I used to work, and work for Clark on the Noman Cole projects. Yeah, I quit so I could have a family. You only raise your kids once. <laughs> At a Duck Donuts in the Outer Banks, she runs to a guy that used to work on the same plant for the same company that I work for. They said, yeah, I quit because I want to have a family. So just keep that in prayer. It's, I, get the, I get something like that. I, the, I, don't want to, I used to work with this Jewish guy who was very, very aggressively Jewish. And he, would talk, he was at work one day and he goes, my mother was talking to me. She's trying to get on me about working for somebody else and uh, getting married and having kids. I'm like, get out of here, Mom. I need to, work, I need to win another project. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. <laughs> he was, he's a character. Uh, on the road, Brother Hunter will be back, Lord willing, September 1st. Amen. He's on. Keep him in prayer. Keep that flight in prayer. He's going to be here for the very last night of Mark McGahey, and he will probably have been awake for 36 straight hours. So he may not be here, and if he does, he probably is not going to be in the greatest. I mean, he's going to have to be back, but 36 hours is a long time. Um, Michelle? I have an answer to your prayer. I was just it's kind of funny. Um, Jared and I were talking Sunday, and I told Jared that the Lord had led me to, he had asked me like uh, a month and a half ago if I'd play for the youth choir here or the adult choir now and I said no I don't really want to like I just said that and he's like well pray about it I said oh okay <laughs> <laughs> so so then on Sunday I I had been praying about it and I was like not really wanting to do it but then I didn't feel like it was a total yes to play for the choir so I was like God if you want me to play this for the choir would you put somebody in my life that can show me how to play the songs because I've never played for the new nana or any of that so I don't really know how to play. I can play piano, but not that style or whatever, or the song. So Miss Betty comes up on Sunday, and she just, like, sits in my lap. She's like, here I am. I can help you. <laughs> so, and now it's funny because Jared and I were laughing that we, like, put out our Gideon fleeces before the Lord because he said the same thing happened mm -hmm. to him. He's like, Pastor Red come to him about the choir, and he's like, like, you know, before he had already been praying about it, and then he's like, well, if Pastor actually comes and tells me, like, maybe three times in a row, like, you know, then then I'll know it's of the Lord. Yeah, eventually you start. <laughs> and he said it like happened or whatever. Like Pastor came and talked to him. And he's like, I was trying to avoid him. Yeah, you threw out your <laughs> fleeces, like, and then you're like. I was like, me and Jared are the same. We put out our fleeces. <laughs> and, and it is funny. That's the Bible story. Okay, I want it to be wet everywhere and not on the fleece. Right. And then and then it happens. He's like, what if I ask for the exact opposite thing? And then it happens. <laughs> like, okay, I guess this right. is it. All right. Um, offering plate is in the back. We've gone a little long, so I'm going to just go straight into the lesson. But I appreciate, I, I don't mind going long on that. You know, a lot of answer to prayer. People say, hey, God did this for me. God did this for me. Hey, pray that God does this for me. And uh, prayers, prayer, if you think about it, prayer is really flattering God. God, I've got a problem, and you can fix it. Uh, uh, hey, God, you're strong enough. You can, you can handle Thank you, Jonathan. You're, you're, you're powerful enough. You care about me. You'll, I know that you'll answer it according to your will, but it's a, it's a way of saying, you know what? God can fix everything that we've said tonight. Every person we put on our list, God can heal them. God can work on their hearts to see them get saved. God can fix the situation. God can do any of Everything we've asked him, he can do. He can save anybody on that salvation list. So uh, we're going to pray, and then we will get started, and we'll see how the night goes. Lord, we love you, God. We thank you for being good to us. Thank you for getting us here on, a, on a Wednesday night. Thank you for a good spirit in here, Lord. Thank you for bringing Miss Mick, Sister Mickey back, Lord, and just, just a real encouraging night tonight, God. I pray you'd help me as I teach, God. I pray you'd help me to teach this as it is according to your word and truth. And I pray that it'd be a help, Lord, to the people that are here, Lord, the people that are watching, Lord, that it'd be a help to them in their Bible reading and their Bible study and growing in their walk with you, Lord, because that's, that's the most important thing. I pray you'd help us. Tonight is a church, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. So I was praying about what to do, and I'm going to try and angle this so everyone could see it. This is not going to be anything wild. This is, um, 
I just want to go through. A lot of times you read your Bible, and the whole point of this is, if you're not reading your Bible, this is going to be cool, and there's, it's not going to do anything else for you. It's just going to be cool. The whole point of this is to be, hey, read your Bible. This will help you read your Bible. Um, but when you read through the Old Testament, the Bible is set up in a specific order. And I, I've taught this before here. The order of the books in your Bible is very, very important. The, the, the order of the books in your Bible teaches you things. But most of your Old Testament is set up in a manner so that you can understand it. And as you get through, you get to the end of the story part, you get start getting into the Psalms and Proverbs, and Job is thrown in there, and you kind of say, okay, well, where, where does all of this go? So I wanted to kind of do a, a simple layout of what the Old Testament is and the timing behind it. Um, when you get... I'm going to put some numbers on some things. These are going to be close numbers because when you put exacts out, there are, the Bible runs like a clock. When you start getting into the timing, so-and-so reigned for this many years and did this, and so-and-so reigned for this many years, and so-and-so was this many years old when he did this. It, the Bible runs very, very, very tightly. It runs perfectly. There are some spots of it that get a little confusing. Like, for example, somebody reigns for 40 years, and then they die, and then there's a civil war, and then somebody else gets in charge. Well, how long is the civil war? Well, then you have to throw in this little three-year gap where no one's king, or two-year gap when no one's king. And the Bible will say things with the direct intent of proving points. For example, Matthew 1. There's 14 generations from Adam to Abraham, 14 from Abraham to David, and 14 from David to Christ. No, there aren't. Was the Bible wrong? No. There are men in that line that were wicked that God excludes. He says, you're a wicked king. I'm not going to remember you. You're gone. And he pulls those men out of that line. And you say, oh, well, there's an error in the Bible. No, those men knew that Bible. They knew that Old Testament well enough to know that there was a man that lived between these two men. And when Matthew sat down to write his Bible or to write his book of the Bible, God said, say there's 14. Well, God, there was this guy. I don't remember him. That man went to hell. Cut him out. Foop, pulls him out. Uh, you have to approach your Bible from the standpoint of this Bible's right. All the numbers are right. All the dates are right. All the ages are right. Well, the Bible says a man lived to be 966. Well, what happened is they missed a decimal point, and he was really 96. No, they didn't miss a decimal point. The man was 966 years old. They did not miss a decimal point. Because if you, if you say, oh, they missed a decimal point, then he had a child when he was six, because he's 65 years old and has a baby. So he must have had one when he was six if you moved the decimal point. Uh, so I want to be very general with these, because it's a, there's a lot of things, Bible prophecy. 400 years from this to this, 400 years from this to this. And I say, well, how come this is 1386 and this is 13, you know, 1182? Well, it's not 400 years. It is, that's what the Bible says. And if I'm off a little number here and there, it's because I'm off a little number here and there. So Adam, Genesis 1, and I'm going to kind of cruise through these old, uh, a lot of these earlier people. Adam is created at about 4,000 B.C., and if you take the time to sit down and run everybody's name and so-and-so we got so-and-so and he was this many years old, and so-and-so we got so-and-so and he was this many years old, you can time all of this out perfectly. And when you get back to Adam, you're at 4,000 B.C. When you take the, the dates that you can hold on to, you say, historically, we know this happened then, and this person was alive then, and this person was king, and when you run it all back, you run back all the ages and the times, Adam is 4,000 B.C. I'm going to write this big, Adam. How long is Adam in the garden? The Bible does not tell you. Now, based on the fact that the Bible runs on good systems and the Bible is very, very mathematical on when things happen, on when you get into the Jubilees and the years of the feasts and uh, Jeremiah and the 70 year captivity and all that, and you find out exactly that God keeps track and time of all these things, you say, okay, this is all significant. Now, you're not going to grow a whole bunch in grace and uh, 
forgiveness and understand, or not understand, but grace and forgiveness and uh, the fruit of the Spirit by knowing all these days. But what it will help you do is say, that's an impressive book there. That's a wild book there. And hopefully going through the timeline helps you understand this is where different things fit historically. Adam's in 400 B.C. Adam is probably there, I would say, for 33 years. That puts him out of the garden around 3960, we'll say six. So he's able 33 and a half years. There's reasons for that. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna preach it hardcore into the ground. Um, you go through all the old people that lived before the flood, and I say old people because they lived to be six, seven, eight hundred, nine hundred years old. And the world gets wicked because if you think about a society in which people live to be 900 years old, people can get really screwed up in 900 years. People can get really weird in 50 years. There's 15-year-olds that I don't want to talk to because it's like, well, hmm. Um, but in 900 years, what happens? Men get wicked. And the wickedness grows until the only person left that God says isn't wicked is Noah and his family. And that's about 2348. Again, you follow the chronology. Noah. And all these dates are given. Adam lives this many years, begets Seth. Seth lives this many years, begets uh, Enos, and others through all these different times. 1,700 years, God gives you the first five chapters of your Bible. Lots of stuff happened between those two men. God said, it's not that important. Don't major in it. Well, what about the, uh, the, the Nephilim and, Eno and the, the, the book of Enoch and all the, the, the this is it. Five chapters in your Bible. Uh, Noah goes through the flood. The flood is roughly 2348. And Abram is, you go after Noah, you've got Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And Shem has his children. And you get uh, Abram, who comes out of Ur of the Chaldees. Abram is born around 2015. And that's Abram. Not, he's not Abraham. Abram. And Abram goes through life, and as he develops his walk with God, and God gives him the promises, and God tells him this is how things are going to go, he changes his name to Abraham, changes Sarah's name from Sarai to Sarah, and he has Isaac, and we'll say, well, he has Isaac when he's 99, and I said I wasn't with hard dates, and now I hear I am with hard dates. Isaac. 99, chasing that little kid around, trying to put diapers on him. So that's about 1916. Isaac lives 40 years. His, fa uh, his father sends out his, his servant to get him a bride. He brings Rebecca back. You read through your Bible. That's uh, early in, I think it's Genesis 17. He's 70 years old. He has twins. He has uh, Jacob and Esau. And Jacob, is the, he's the patriarch. Jacob has... Twelve children. One of them is Joseph. Joseph goes into Egypt. Joseph takes Jacob and his whole family into Egypt. Now, up until this point, use green. Um, Adam lives in Eden. Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and all, well, Isaac up to Jacob, all of them wander. God makes it very clear. They are strangers and pilgrims in the land. They wander through the promised land. And we're going to put Jacob. And I want to get an close on this one. Jacob, he's around 1800. All right. Yes, I will write larger. Oh, you did give me the eraser. Thank you. Jacob. He's around 1800. And he has his 12 children, and Joseph, and they all, from there, they go from being wanderers in the land of Canaan to living, let's see, this is where I'm going to forget, Canaan, C-A-A-N-A-N. -A -A That'd be Canaan. Canaan. This is, you get up here, oh, I already, I'm already dyslexic, it's bad enough. 
Canaan. They wander in the land of Canaan. And when the famine happens, they go from Canaan down into Egypt. And in Egypt, they live there for about three generations. Now, this is where you have to really start dividing your Bible up and applying it the right way. God makes a promise to Abraham. He says, in Isaac shall thy seed be called. He says, they're going to go into a strange land. They're going to be afflicted 400 years by the Egyptians. You say, well, Joseph goes in, and they're there for three generations. Three generations is not 400 years, not by any stretch of the imagination. Why is that? Well, the affliction doesn't start when they go into Egypt. So you say, well, they're going to be afflicted by the Egyptians for 400 years. They are afflicted by the Egyptians for 400 years because the affliction doesn't start when they go in. The affliction starts with Ishmael. Ishmael's mom is Hagar. Hagar is an Egyptian woman. And how does, why does uh, Ishmael get thrown out? He gets thrown out because he's making fun of Sarah and Isaac. So the affliction starts back there, and that's how you get your 400 years. But again, if you just take the Bible at surface value and you say, oh, it says 400, 400 years and three generations, that doesn't work, and you throw the Bible out as being wrong and full of errors, well, one, you're not studying to show yourself approved unto God, a worker in the need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And two, you're not taking that God is proving things when he puts these chronologies in here. He's showing you what matters to him. That's the interesting thing about the Bible. That is really the interesting thing about the Bible on why does God take 14 chapters to tell you what a tent in the wilderness looks like and then 14 more chapters to re-describe that tent in the wilderness when really he spends 1,700 years of history in five chapters. This is a tent that we're, I'm talking about the tabernacle that they build when they get out of Egypt. Why does that matter? It does matter. It's very, very, very important. It's a pattern of the heavens, according to Hebrews. If you study that well enough, you'll figure out how the heavens work, which, to my knowledge, nobody does know. <laughs> but God said, no, it's so important, I'm going to put the exact same description in there twice. You'll figure it out eventually when I want you to. But they go in here. Sorry, I'm off on a tangent. That book is, that's, a, that's an interesting book. That's a wild book. They go into Canaan. Jacob goes into Canaan and dies, and they take him out, and they bury him outside the land of Canaan. And Joseph says, don't bury me in Egypt. When I die, put my bones in a box, and when you leave, take my bones with you and bury me with my fathers. So from Jacob, Jacob's descendants, we'll say Joseph, all the way up to Moses. Put Joseph in here because he's important. And then Moses. Is about 16, oh, about 1,500. Again, I'm working in generalities because I don't want to contradict myself doctrinally. I was just talking to Brother Klotz. <laughs> He's laughing. He knows what I'm talking about. He said, is, is that the unpardonable sin or an unpardonable sin? Boy, you better figure out if you're saying the or an. Does the Bible that specific? The Bible's that specific. We're going to throw a comma in there and switch a whole doctrine around. The Catholic Church messes with the punctuation in a sentence to change whether or not Jesus Christ is God. <laughs> it's important. That Bible says you need to know every, or it is impossible that one jot or tittle of the law shall fail. That means that every comma, every semicolon, every capital letter is in there for an exact perfect reason. And when you start getting to where you, where you sit down, you have a conversation with somebody who really knows their Bible, you have to really watch your words. Say, so, well, hold on. And, I, and that's why sometimes I get up here and I struggle and I fall all over myself. Well, this is, well, it's kind of, well, because you know that, hey, that Bible's run tight and I don't want to say anything that isn't true. But I'm, not, I'm trying not to get deep and I'm doing it. Um, Jacob, to, from, from Joseph really into Moses, the Israelites live in Egypt. And they're there until Moses is born. He gets adopted by Pharaoh's daughter. When he's a young man, he murders the guy, hides his body in the sand, and runs away, generalizing. When you really study people's ages out, it's kind of wild. Moses gets called to go back and lead the children of Israel out of Egypt when he's 80 years old. So pastor is almost ready to start his ministry. Give him another... <laughs> Go for another 40 years, 40 more years. <laughs> but really, 
God says, all right, lead them out of Israel, or lead Israel out of Egypt. So, and again, you have to think, things happen in time. You don't just read it and just boom, boom, boom. No, he goes back to Egypt. It takes him a while to get there. When he gets there, he does the ten plagues. Well, it's not, here's Monday's plague, here's Tuesday's plague, here's Wednesday's plague. When you read through them, it's, hey, I'm going to kill all the animals in the land of Egypt. And then when the next plague, he says, bring them in from the hail or I'll kill all your animals. Well, what does that mean? That means that between when he has the, the blight on the animals and when he brings the hail, there's a little bit of time for the Egyptians to either steal them away from the Israelites and start breeding their own and get their own stocks built back up. And he says, hey, at one point, hey, the hail's going to come in and it's going to burn up all these crops. And then the locusts are going to come in and eat all the crops. Well, I thought they already got burned up. Yeah, that's because it burned up everything that's on the ground. But then the seeds that are planted that haven't sprouted yet, he's going to take them out too. Like if God had just gone in and just wiped out all the crops, you know, if you wipe out everything in May, you've got stuff underground that hasn't come up yet. If the, if the locusts eat everything off the ground in May, come June, you're going to have stuff springing up. So God says, I'm going to take them out in early harvest. I'm going to take them out in mid-harvest. I'm going to take out everything they got. I'm going to take out all their animals, all their plants, all their fruit trees, all of everything. I, he takes of everything from Egypt. And he grinds Egypt into the ground, and Egypt never recovers from this, ever. Today has not recovered from this. Because of everything that, that they go through, they never become a major power. They do gain some strength back later on in your Bible, which we'll get into here in a minute. But they never grow to the point where they were as strong as they were when they had Israel. Why? Because God puts his blessing on his people. So you lose the people, you lose the blessing, and you don't take care of them. I will curse them that curse thee. Uh, Moses gets out about 1,500, and this is another thing I want to write in here that's important. Let me use red. This is from Adam to Joseph, the book of Genesis. Moses shows up in Exodus. Uh, I believe he really he gets going in Exodus chapter 2. Uh, Moses, you know the story, he takes the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. They go into the wilderness. They get to the promised land. They get cold feet. God says, you're going to wander for 40 years. And they wander for 40 years. And just before they get into the promised land, God says, Moses, I would let you in, but you sinned, and I can't let you in because of this reason. So you're going to die after 40 years of walking around in the wilderness, and Joshua's going to take him in. Oh, I'm going to fall off the stage here. You guys would remember the lesson if I fell off the stage. 1450 is Joshua. And this is where you have a major shift in how the Bible is, how dense the Bible is in terms of books. Moses through Joshua, they are wandering in the wilderness. And that is several books of your Bible. Uh, that's Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Um, so that's Exodus, Deuteronomy. Again, this is, this, all these people, and like half the male Christian population is named after the people on this board. It's your first five books of the Bible. Really, most of them come out of Genesis. And... Genesis is very, very, very important. Very important. But God says, as far as the story is concerned, you're going to get a little tiny portion of it, and I'm going to take this other stuff, and I'm going to blow up these other different things to show you where the emphasis is. And a lot of your Bible, you learn what the importance of the book of Genesis is. You learn, why is Abram so significant? Why is Joseph so significant? Why is Moses so significant? You, and you really don't understand the value of these men until long after they're dead. Um, but Joshua takes them into the land, and the Bible, again, the Bible goes very linear at the, at the start. You get into Judges. What happens, what's the book of Judges? The book of Judges is about 400 years of different men where the children of Israel, when they would get into trouble, God would raise up a man who wasn't king. He was just a judge. And he would say, you guys need to do this. You need to stop doing this. You need to read the law. You need to start following the law. You need to get rid of the false gods. You need to do this. And he leads them in, generally he'll lead them in combat. There's one female judge, Deborah. She does not lead in combat, but she does a whole bunch of other good stuff. 
And these judges have authority, but they're not king. And they run for about 400 years. Now, I'm going to cut it a little short here at about 1,100. But this is the judges. And the judges, again, this is Israel in the land. This is the, 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 all of this takes place in Israel. I apologize, this is kind of a weak marker, but I don't have a darker color, I don't think. Um, but they are in the land of Israel. Joshua judges. You get all these different stories of Samson and Gideon and all that. And then you get into Ruth which is this tiny little excerpt about a Midian, or about a woman who lives outside of the land of Egypt. She is not a Jew. She marries a Jew. And then he dies, and then she moves with her mother-in-law back to, the land of Egypt, or back to the land of Israel and marries a guy. On its own, it's kind of insignificant. Why does, this, why does one random woman marrying somebody who's a different nation than her, a different nationality, a different race, and then moving back, why does that matter? Well, you study through the lineage, and you find out that Ruth ends up in the line of Jesus Christ, like a couple of other important people, like Rahab. There you, you get some Gentiles get in the line of Christ. But you go through Joshua, Judges, Ruth, and then you get into 1 Samuel. Um, 1 Samuel starts at about 1100, and for the sake of time, you've got Samuel, Samuel is the last, the last judge of Israel, and the judges are, they have their own historical significance. He's the last judge. He and Israel goes to him at that point and says, we want a king. We want somebody to be in charge of us all the time. We're tired of just having a judge that only pops up when we have trouble. We want somebody all the time. And Samuel says, no, that's not a good idea. God doesn't want that. And then God says, all right, they really want it. I'll give it to them, but it's going to be Saul. And Samuel judges his whole life. And then you have Saul. Saul becomes king at about 11, or about, yeah, the, well, the judges end and Saul starts, so around 1100. So this, this, these judges run from 1450 to 1100. Let's get that out of there so it's not confusing. You have Saul, and then David shows up. Book of first, first Samuel is Saul is king, David's running. 2 Samuel, David is king, and then 1 Kings, David dies, and you have all of his children and his sons and his lineage and the kings that happen after him. So Saul into David, into Solomon. Now this is important for a lot of reasons, about 1050 and about 11 or about 1000. Solomon turns out to be one of your strongest types of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ in the Bible, and he starts at exactly 1,000 B.C., or he doesn't start, he really gets the temple going at about 1,000 B.C. And there's all kinds of parallels in there and all kinds of types that run in through there. The Israel is still, they're still living in the land of Israel at this point. You get up through Solomon, and then Solomon has Rehoboam, he has Jeroboam, I always get these two guys mixed up. He has Rehoboam. Solomon has Rehoboam. It's his son. And at this point, uh, let me get my map out. This is about what your land of Israel looks like. You've got the coastline. You've got your Med Mediterranean Sea. Down here is Egypt. And your Nile River runs up through here. You got your Sinai Peninsula, Saudi Arabia goes way down in here and over. But your land of Israel starts up here at the Sea of Galilee. And it runs south. This is the Jordan River. And then it ends in the Dead Sea. Uh, that's where Sodom used to be. The Jews come out of Egypt, they go, they wander around here, they come, they cross the Red Sea, they're in here, and the land of Israel is a kingdom unified under the judges, and they kind of, uh, when they, uh, I'm sorry, I'm jumping all over, in the book of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, when they cross over, the 
Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh say, we really don't want to cross over. We want to keep our land over here because it's good for cattle. And they say, that's fine. You still have to help us conquer. They say, that's fine. We'll do it, and then we'll go back. So Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh are over here. Half of Manasseh. Here, it's in the middle period there. And then everybody else crosses the Jordan and sets up their kingdom here. Up until Solomon, everybody kind of gets along. They're family. They fight sometimes. Sometimes they kill each other, but they always get together. And they are one nation. They're supposed to be serving God. Their judges and prophets are there to keep them serving God. Keep serving God. Keep, and then they get all messed up and sideways and things happen. It's, and really, most of the stuff that happens in your Bible is the slow story of people getting messed up and getting doing wrong and then God bringing them back in as they get right again and then them doing wrong. They never really just stay right with, get right with God and stay right. It's always a struggle. When Solomon takes over as king, he takes over. He's running this whole area. He's got a great rule. It's, a gold, it's Israel's golden age. Israel peaked with Solomon historically. To this day, has never surpassed where they were with Solomon. Solomon has his son, Rehoboam, Rehoboam says, my dad was rich, I want to be richer. And the people say, we ain't having that. So Jeroboam, who is just, he's a Jewish man, says, well, you guys don't have to listen to him anymore. And what happens is the kingdom splits right around here. And like I said before, you've got your 12 tribes from, uh, from Jacob. You've got 10 up here in the north and two in the south, Judah and Benjamin and Levi. You said two in the south. Levi has no inheritance. Levi, everybody says, you could break this up into states. You've got the state of Judah, the state of Benjamin, the state of Gad, the state of Manasseh. Levi has no state. They just float. What they're supposed to do is they're supposed to live all over and tell people the law and teach people how to follow God. And what happens is when Jeroboam takes over these 10 northern tribes and says, well, I'm king now, he says, I don't want people going down here to Jerusalem to worship because if they go to this other city's capital, they're going to turn on me. So I'll start my own religion. So he starts his own religion for the purpose of keeping his people in bondage to him, just like Henry VIII. You read history. He starts his own religion, and he puts a golden calf up here, and he puts a golden calf down here and says, all right, you worship here and here. That's Dan and Beer. No, that's not Beersheba. Uh, one in Dan and I believe one in, mm, it's the name of a city, I can't remember right now. But he's got the, you have the 10 tribes up here, and then, so all of Levi migrates down here because they're not getting supported up here because they're serving false gods. Now, this is, I was really hoping to get a lot farther than this. When you get into the split, the split of the kingdoms, the kingdom split at about 950 BC, this is when a lot of your prophets start prophesying. Uh, right at, well, I'm not even going to get it. 950, give or take, is the split. First, like I said, 1 Samuel is David running from Saul. 2 Samuel is David on the throne. 1 Kings, you start getting all these different kings. Uh, Jeroboam and his son does this, and his son's son does this. Rehoboam, his son's. And what happens is the narrative splits. It'll talk about the kings of Israel up here, and this part here is always referred to as Israel. This part down here is always referred to as Judah. Even though it's got Benjamin and Levi in it, this is Judah, this is Israel. Sometimes this is referred to as Ephraim, because Ephraim was the most dominant tribe in the north. So they'll have, this will have three different names. This has got two different names. When, you're, when you get to 1 Kings 13, it starts talking about a prophet. The focus goes from these men rule Israel to the men who preach to Israel. And then when you get to uh, 1 Kings chapter 17, Elijah comes in, and from 1 Kings 17 on until Elijah dies, the only reason you know who's king is because Elijah preaches at him, which is Ahab. And the rest of it, it follows the life of Elijah. It breaks 
the normal timeline of these are the people who are in charge. It doesn't talk about them anymore. Who's it talking about? It's talking about the prophets and the preachers and their messages and their miracles and what happens to them and what they do for the country. The whole focus shifts. Second Kings covers some of this. It goes, it goes back and forth between the ministry of Elisha, who comes after Elijah, and uh, the kings of Israel and Judah. So you start to where you're following like about three different timelines. And don't get confused because you do this in TV shows all the time. So oh, the Bible's too confusing. I can't follow all the stuff that's going on. You follow nine different timelines and whatever is on HBO right now. So don't give me any of that. I you know, I've, I know, Deuteronomy, and then you get uh, Joshua right there, Book of Judges, in the middle is Ruth, and then first and second, Samuel. So it's right there, and then first and second Kings. Now, I'm not going to run through the rest of it because I wanted to go through the rest of it, but this is. This was the introduction. <laughs> First and Second Chronicles. Everybody, if you read your Bible through, if you just, I just read it through for beginning to end. When you get to First Chronicles, you always take a deep breath. Oh boy, Adam, Seth, Enos, and then it goes for about twenty odd chapters of names and priests and rotations. Yeah, those are all important. Not all of them. I, I remember somebody, I was talking to somebody, and they had just won somebody to the Lord, and the lady they had won to the Lord called them and said, I'm in First Chronicles, do I need to know all these people? And he said, no, <laughs> you don't need to know all those people. <laughs> but I will tell you, there is some wild stuff in early Chronicles. It's in there. It's hard to find. <laughs> it's very interesting. On the lineages of priests and who's in office, and Brother Klotz went through a whole thing on figuring out when, when Christ was actually born based on the rotations of Zachariah's priesthood given in Luke chapter 1. When you get into how that Bible times itself, it is like a well-put-together watch. When you get through all the different courses of all those different priests, and it says, okay, this person, this timing, and this here, and it's on this many divisions, and it goes, and this person's right here. And the reason I say all of that is that when you get into your New Testament, it starts talking about Jesus Christ and when he was born and when he was anointed and when he dies. Those things are all given in exact detail. Uh, and I know I haven't gone to the Bible, but one, one thing really quickly here, Luke. Go to the book of Luke. Luke is a doctor. And Luke writes like a doctor. What does that mean? Luke is very thorough. Luke chapter 3. Luke is very detailed. Luke is very, very meticulous. That's why most of his chapters have 50 and 60 verses in them. He's a doctor. If you read your Bible based on a certain number of chapters a day, instead of a certain number of pages, when you get to the book of Luke, you take a deep breath. Because <laughs> you're going to be there for a couple of minutes. Luke chapter 3, verse 1. Now, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar... Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being the tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip tetrarch of Eturia, and of the region of Trachonitis and Licinius, the tetrarch of Abilene, Annas and Caiaphas being the high priests, the word of the God came unto John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. Well, what does all that have to do with anything? You can't figure out what the, why is all that in there? To tell you exactly the date that Jesus Christ gets baptized, because the rest of this chapter is talking about Jesus Christ getting baptized by John the Baptist. Now, if I said to you, in the year that Boris Johnson was prime minister and Angela Merkel was prime minister and Donald Trump was president, you could take those three and narrow that down to a matter of two years. And that's exactly why Luke puts this in here. Because the date that Jesus Christ gets baptized to start his ministry is important. And all of the dates that are given in your Bible are important when you start going into why is Passover important? Why does tabernacles matter to the church age? All of your timing runs tight. The Bible is put together to say, hey, I'm going to be doing these things at these times. And can you find the date of the rapture with math? Maybe. 
I won't say that you can. I would say that the way that God does timing, where he says 400 years here to here, when Moses takes the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, he says that was 400 years to the day that I said you were going to be afflicted by Israel or afflicted by Egypt. 400 years to the day. And God put that in there for a reason. One of the reasons is just to show you this book written by 23 or so different men over 3000 over a span of 2000 years even though it's got all these different authors that are all men, oh, the Bible was written by men. Yeah, but the, the men couldn't make this work out. Men could not get all their dates right. Men could get, not get all their math right. Why? Because they didn't know. They didn't know that all their math worked out. They didn't know that all their dates were perfect, all their seasons were perfect. They just, they know, God told me to write this. I wrote this. Well, how come your cross-references jump boom, 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 boom? Well, they don't know that. They have no idea. They had no idea. But with you sitting here with a completed Bible, you can say, you know what? That thing is tight. So when somebody says, well, why do you believe the Bible? Because the Bible works. There is no way men can do what this book does. Um, I'm going to cut here because what I was hoping to get into tonight, and maybe we'll get into later on. Yes. It Sunday morning. Okay, we'll do. That'll work. I'll do Sunday morning. But because of what I was going to get into with this is you've got all these here, everything I've written up here is in order in your Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, it all happens in order. And then you get into Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, and then Job. And Job's a floater. Job. Job's a floater. Uh, Psalms is David, Proverbs, Song of Solomon, Ecclesiastes. And then you get into Isaiah. And unless you really know the timeline of the Bible, you know Isaiah is preaching, and he's mad about Israel not doing right. But you kind of read, and it's like, okay, here's a preacher preaching against a bunch of wicked people. Okay. But if you don't know the whole structure, he's just kind of a guy preaching. When you really get into what these countries do, and the setup of it, and how it all goes together. You say, oh, I get it now. He's talking to the ten northern tribes before they go into captivity to preach them a message about this. Why does that matter? Because almost everything that happened, almost everything that happened, pretty much everything that happens, Isaiah on, Psalms on, really, Job on, really, is prophecy. It's got a double application. You can take all of these books right here and say, this is a story of this. This is the story of this. This is the story of this. Isaiah is the written out preachings of a man who preached for his whole life. And it says, hey, this is what this man was preaching about, but this is also what he was talking about. See, it applies to the Jews living in Egypt. It applies to the Jews living in Israel. It applies to the Gentiles living in Assyria. But it also applies to the United States in 2022. And until you can really under, you understand how that Bible is put together and understand the divisions in it, a lot of it is very, well, I'm reading it, but I don't know what I'm reading. Okay, Jeremiah preached. Yes, the Jews did bad things. I get it. But why? And that's what I'm kind of hoping is to, to put together, uh, is to say, look, this is why it mattered historically, but also this is why it matters prophetically, doctrinally, future. So... And also, when you read your Bible to understand, this is who he's talking to. This makes more sense because now I know who's doing what, when, and where, and how, and why. So I hope that made sense. I know I go really fast, and I stutter all the time. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, we wouldn't want to not challenge you. Um, but Lord willing, I'll finish this up on Sunday. And... It's here, again, I said at this beginning, I'm going to say this at the end now. This, is, this is, helps you understand your Bible better if you read your Bible. If you don't read your Bible, then okay, that's cool. Okay, I, now I know the Old Testament. No, you don't know the Old Testament. <laughs> don't tell people you know the Old Testament. We preach the Bible in church. How do you know your Bible? And if you're reading and you get confused and you get kind of lost and know who in the world is Joel talking to and what is he saying about that, 
this, Lord willing, will help you break it down. So let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Yes. Okay. I will do that Sunday morning. Lord, we love you, God. We thank you for being here, God. And just, I pray you'd help, Lord, that this would help your people understand your word better, God. And I pray that something up here today is that, Lord, would just help make things click, help things start running together and just making sense, Lord, and help people to, to understand you, your nature, how you deal with people, Lord, what you love, what you hate, what makes you mad. Lord, understand where this world is going and where it's been, Lord, and to be able to learn from it, Lord, and just be able to understand just how rich and how deep your word is, God, and have a deeper appreciation for it, God. I pray you just bless in something feeble that was said here tonight, that it would help this church to, to grow in its Bible knowledge and its Bible understanding, Lord. God, we ask that you come back soon and get us and get us out of this mess, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.